For many years now, Russ and Craig have had many wide-ranging conversations with folks from all over the gaming world. This is one of those conversations. D6G, the Lost Chapter. Hey, welcome back to Dunkin' Donuts. Craig, what are you having today, Dunkin sir? Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, I am having chocolate frosted. You know, they uh, don't make... You know what I noticed? They used to actually make dunkable donuts with little handles on them. Do you remember those? Oh, that's, that's, that's a long gone. I know. Yeah. Does anybody even dunk the donuts? In? Do they even make plain donuts anymore? Seriously? Uh, I don't know. What is that about? Hey, Craig, who's that in the corner over there? Is that... Uh, is that... John Regal, is that John from Dak and Dak. John, how you doing, man? Or is man? it Sean Connery? I oh, it's nom nom nom. Oh, hey, how's it going, guys? Hey, you look oh, a lot like Sean he's Connery. He's a method actor in as well. Right? <laughs> I'm loudly eating my donut. <laughs> nom nom nom. <laughs> so, John, what do you like at Dunkin' Donuts? What's your favorite donut? Uh, I have a satchel full of world famous Los Angeles Randy's donuts that I'm sneaking into oh, Dunkin' see? Donuts and putting them there. My favorite is because last time I was on, I said I like buttermilk, uh, the buttermilk bar. And yeah. you guys were like, what, what is that? What is this? And you guys don't know about buttermilk bars. So no. I, have to, I have to sneak them in and place them in there for you to have the majesty of the buttermilk bar. Right. Oh, I got to no. visit L.A. now and have a buttermilk bar. I want to That's right. Are. All for that. So I'm eating a buttermilk bar because I love them so much. Oh, excellent. Well, uh, we'll just you know budget some extra treadmill time and enjoy some more you know, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. for that. Absolutely. We thought since John it was available, we thought, you know, John, since you um, – we're sitting around here, and you know the internets are always alive with everyone talking about what Games Workshop is up to now. A Twitter, it, a Twitter, yes, a Twitter. A what Twitter a pun! Indeed. It's a pun. Uh, yes, it seems like um, everyone has a theory as to what James Games Workshop's current strategy is, and so it's going to be kind of fun since the three of us have been, you know, involved with one way or another with with playing and or in some cases selling and or in some cases running large websites. Uh, uh, for fan communities around the Games Workshop stuff. It might be fun for us to kind of talk a little bit about uh, the past a little bit and then maybe what they're doing now and, and whatever limited analysis we can offer on on uh, on what we think is happening. Uh, why not, right? Pure speculation. Pure that's exactly. We're making it up. And there will be no hate because that's our show. No hate. Maybe a little disappointment here and there, but, you know. We'll the opinions to... expressed here are of the individual expressing them and do yes. not represent the D6 generation. Or dakadakadaka. <laughs> or dakadakadaka. <laughs> right. Uh, well, let's talk about, you know, before we can go to the future and the present, we must talk about the past. Right? So I don't want to spend a lot of this on the past a little bit too much, but, but what did we, you know, I think a lot of us talk about the, the late 90s and early 2000s as kind of like the heyday uh, mm -hmm. of Games Workshop. Um, what did we... What do we like about the past? What what sort of not in the game specifics, but what what did the company do back in those days that we thought were really good good policies? Well, um, I think I would start off just by saying I think it wasn't a publicly traded company, and uh, mm. I think that that changes the whole makeup of of the way that, that you do business when you have to uh, appease the bottom line to your shareholders as opposed to just taking chances and and doing little things. Um, so I think that's the number one thing that everything else, everything else comes after that. I mean, I don't think that you would have a lot of the amazing things that they have today if they, if they didn't get that infusion of cash, but at the same time, it's sort of changed their whole, the whole way they do business. But I think for most people would agree games workshop back in the day, in those days had, had, um, 40 K and, and Warhammer fantasy battle, but they had basically a, a third system that they would constantly bring out something new mm -hmm. and then they would kill it and stop supporting it right. and uh, leave it sort of like sitting there for a while and they would do another thing as a third thing and then they might come back to that third thing in the future and sort of come out with a new edition but so you always felt like there was there was something new um, always happening these smaller games these Necromundas these Space Hulks um, you know more times Battlefleet Gothics and and I think I don't know if if um their deal with New Line to get the the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit killed their ability to do that, but I think that's that's a huge thing that people that have liked them for a long time definitely miss. Mm. Yeah, I remember when I remember when Lord of the the Lord of the Rings deal came out. I know a lot of longtime Games Workshop fans thought that would be the death of the company. <laughs> they thought they'd spent whatever they'd spent was too much, and they would never recoup recoup the 
Now, the I remember that when that happened, though, uh, you saw Games Workshop products in places like Barnes & Noble and actually in Electronics Boutique and other places actually carried them. So they were able to get penetration for a brief period of time, um, you know, with those things. But it, I don't know that the long-term benefit really... You know, help them. Right. I, I, I think I didn't we paid. see like there was an at the at, as each film landed, there was an infusion of cash that didn't right. sustain, and that like they they would look good for a while. But at the same time, the whole public the the the, the going on the the London Stock Exchange, they did that in 1994, I believe. Yeah, I think they were still cool before after that. And I and I would say they did most of their great work after that. So. So I I don't think like we can make this an anti corporate thing alone, <laughs> although that is usually the impulse of everyone, including myself. Um, but clearly something happened at at some point, or at least that's what it seems like on the outside, where they the the perception anyway of the vast majority of of gamerdom is that their focus went from like making cool games and being a game company to being a company it, and those of us who aren't children never begrudged them that they wanted to make money. I mean, we all understand right. that these companies right. are there to make money, but it seemed like at some point in the last five or 10 years that the focus became far more about the money and far less about the, the, the community that they had built at yeah, one point. I think, I think that's what I, that, that I see the most like, um, you know, in the in the late '90s, GW did a lot of interesting things in early 2000s too to really support both their retailers and their community. Um, you know, if you remember back then, like the Bits Bus, you remember the Bits right. Bus? Yeah. Oh, I they had the a Bits vehicle Bus. that would drive around at their cost, and they would drive to stores. And it wasn't just GW stores; it was any independent retailer. So we ran Daka Daka the store. They'd come to our store, and they'd set up there, and people could come in. And buy Forge World like right out of your store. It was like a little traveling shop, and all the GW, you could order GW bits right there, all that stuff. And the store still got margin on that. So you actually, it was a cool cooperative event. GW got a lot of promotion publicity. You know, you got huge mobs in your store, and it was just a great event. Also, GW had a lot. I think a lot more organized play. Yeah. Uh, back then, well, Not they only, they were hosting their own grand tournaments. Right. They had their own grand yeah. tournaments in, in m- many major cities across the U.S. and indeed around yep. the world. They had. Um, you know, multiple games days across the country. They had, you know, things like Armageddon and really major events that were, you know, internet based, global, and yeah. global that affected the universe. And Codexes came out just for that. And so there was a, there was a time where they really felt like uh, that their business model was: the more we support the community, the more money we'll make. Right and now, the dark side of that was you. Even then, you heard rumors that. They were using all of this community outreach to more to rather than just support the the the, the local your local pro- professional game store. It was more to look at the numbers of the local professional game store as a key of where they can put their next store. Yeah, I don't think they did right. that initially, but that became the next. No, no, model. exactly. Yeah. Well, there were rumors even yeah. at the heyday, but most of us were like, "That's not true." Later on, it turned out I don't know that they were doing it back then. I, I would like to think not, because I would like to think that back when we loved them, they were lovable. That's what I would like <laughs> to think. Well, you know I, what I mean? Well, go ahead, Joe. Well, I also think that you know, anytime you look at the past, you look at it through the rose-colored glasses. I mean, right. even the the things that I was talking about, like Mordheim and all those different games. They essentially were killing one off to bring out the next one. And right. even back then, even though we all remember it fondly, people were always Upset. both shocked and flash outraged that whatever yeah. game that they liked, Necromunda or Battlefleet Gothic, was now axed more or less to bring out the next new thing. And that yeah. drove people insane. So it's like a, a double edged thing. People want a third game, but then they don't want that, they don't understand that you can't keep supporting an infinite number of different games at least yeah. not this yeah. company so especially the, most of those games were niche within a niche but so i, I think to right. come back to, to john your earlier point about the um, i don't know that being public did this but at some point they got really focused on their bottom line and what they started figuring out was that we make better margins if we sell it ourselves and right. so For they sure. started they started implementing processes in place like you can't buy online except from us, right? 
And that yep. really was just because, and they'll say it's because there was deep internet discounting, but they're still deep internet discounting. What what it was really was actually was that, that's not what they their their public stance on that is that they're always trying to support the gaming community. Yeah, right. No, they're trying to make that, it so that, that does not do that. That's yeah. their public doing they were a lot trying of to the support research. Brick and mortar retailers is what they yeah, said. Exactly. But they weren't that's, because yeah, our that's, store that's for on example, their front their corporate right. front page. But our store even then was making a substantial amount of revenue through our website. Even though we didn't discount at all, we just because right. people like Daka Daka, they'd come and buy, try to support the site and the store. You know, even though they could make it to the store, so there was by taking that away, um, that was tough. But then, Craig, to your point, they realized, well, wait a minute, if we opened our, and this is where they got confused because um, <laughs> they, apparently they they don't know retail. And I have some interesting stories about that, but but uh, they they said, well, wait, if we had our own stores. We would make better margins, except they forget it costs money to run a store. You have to staff a store. You have to do all that stuff. And so you didn't make the margins. But they started putting these stores in place, thinking we can replace the local retailers with our own channel uh, and own our own channel and run our own channel. And how hard can it be? We do that in England, you know. And the problem in the U.S. is it's much, much bigger than England. And having that many stores you run, you staff, you maintain is a lot of work. Um, and I think that's where they ran into trouble. And so they, 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 alienated a little bit of their from the business side they alienated a lot of a lot of the independent retailers when they started doing that so i have a a theory as to why why all this sort of occurred um and uh i think i might have mentioned it in actually the uh the actual segment of the show which you'll hear later in the time warp Mm -hmm. um but basically the idea that i have is is that games workshop is the only company, miniature company, I should say, that reached essentially market saturation um, Mm. of its customer potential customer base. And that's not to say that they had everybody at some point, but, you know, there's always going to be some people that don't like the game and don't want to play it. But for the most part, they reached everybody that they were going to to reach with their message. So that person had made a decision, hey, I either want to play, you know, Games Workshop game or I don't want to play a Games Workshop game. And Unlike a traditional market where you're basically, you know, you can always try to keep growing it through advertising, through building new stores, Mm -hmm. getting the word out. They, at some point they started saying in their, in their um, stock, in their stock, like briefs of of their company that basically that there is a miniature gaming gene in people um, Mm -hmm. and only certain people have it. And basically the idea is no matter how much you want to promote the idea of a hobby game to people, there's some people that are never going to want to take the time to paint models. And that's just the way it is. And if you buy into that idea, which I personally do, that means you can only reach, you know, a certain number of people. And once, no matter how much advertising money you put in, no matter how many stores you build, you're not going to be reaching any extra people. And so I think that puts a company which has reached all those people into a really dangerous position because all of a sudden you can't grow by getting new people constantly what do you do you have to monetize you have to monetize your fan base as as much as possible you have to get every amount of money you can out of the people that that have that hobby gene and that doesn't mean ripping them off it means providing them with what they perceive as value for money um so so making them feel like whatever they're buying is worth the high price Mm -hmm. and honestly if you lose two or three or four people you know, out of 10, but you're charging two or three times that, and that money is going directly to your web store and all these things, then, then you can, you can, you know, sustain growth that way for a while. And and that's pretty much, I think what they've been doing for the last maybe five to 10 years. You know, that's a really good observation, John. I think that's um, very, uh, very insightful. And if you think about, I think that might've happened too. If you look back at like what happened to TSR and, and, Dungeons and Dragons, that might happen to them too, where you just sort of, every person knows about Dungeons and Dragons and those who are going to play it own their books. And now what do you do? Right. Right. Um, right. I mean, there was a time when who would have believed TSR was gone. Right. So it's, you know, and so maybe Games Workshop saw the writing on the wall. They're like, well, we need more expensive toys that are now, you know, because I was always confused, you know, it makes a lot of sense because I was always confused as why GW didn't offer any cooperative advertising, right? So like, like you ever watch, TV and you see an ad for a comic store, it'll show like DC Comics, Batman, Superman, come to the comic shop down on Main Street, right? And that's right. because DC offers cooperative advertising, so they help the store promote, and that's why it's showing DC Comics there, right? So it makes it affordable for a small store. So when we had a store, we reached out to Jimmy, hey, do you want to help us advertise? And, you know, and they were like, Jimmy's like, no, we don't really advertise. And they don't. And that's they always don't. puzzled me that they don't. But your theory makes a lot of sense, and that is they, if their theory is 
we are what we 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 have we've saturated the market. There's no one else to get. Um, then that's going to totally change your business tactics. Yeah, I mean, it's going to it'd be a waste to advertise it. Right. And so what they're what they're doing now is the advertising that you see is licensing out to Fantasy Flight to make board games. It's licensing. Right their games out for video games because those are our markets that can reach different people. And so they let those other companies deal with the marketing and the cost mm-hmm. to get the word out. But honestly, you know, only that tiny percentage of people that are actually interested in, in painting and playing a hobby game are going to find their way back to the core game. So, mm-hmm. so those people and the game itself, the hobby game, it's all about presenting it as a, to get the maximum amount of money out of each individual person that's playing and then create your growth through going into other avenues, books, uh, you know, movies or, or whatever, animated things, uh, video games, uh, board games, whatever. Um, so, so that's really, when I look at it that way, it makes sense what they're doing. Um, and I also don't think any other miniature gaming company has come anywhere near that. So, so I think anytime you talk about a privateer press or you talk about any of these other companies, they're basically on the same trajectory that Games Workshop was 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I, I said this on the last podcast, I'm, I'm always interested to see if somebody did get to that position of, of equal footing is what Games Workshop accomplished exactly what they would do. Because I don't know, I don't know where you go. It, it's kind of a, it's a niche, a niche thing. So I don't know exactly how, how that works. Well, you can see, you can start to see, um, privateer presses in that place, you know they've they've got their own lock and load events now. They're making board games and other things. You can you can sort of see that they are going down that road, and it will be very interesting to watch and see if they can somehow avoid uh, getting in this position. Because you're right, you, you think about it that way. It's, it's it's sort of like when you run out of green field, what do you do? Uh, well, and and I think that's why you see Games Workshop stopping Games Day and yeah. stopping all of its events. It, it's basically going into like a laser focus mode mm-hmm. of. We're just going to have our core game here, and, and we're going to focus on making that the best product we can so we can make people feel like there's value behind that. And we're going to get rid of all this ancillary stuff because, honestly, all that other stuff is basically just advertising. So, so you know, I think a company like Privateer Press, because they are a, um, a privately held company, mm-hmm. if they want to, they could continue to potentially do events like their lock and load events and stuff like that and take the the advertising hit so to speak mm-hmm. even knowing it's not the best thing just to sort of like you know keep the goodwill up whereas right. i think a company like games workshop has to try to keep manufacturing growth um for their bottom line right so, yeah, they're worried about ebitda and all that stuff right so so that's that's really interesting i i think that's a really mm-hmm. great observation um how do you think it's affecting so let's talk a little bit now um how they're trending so i i, I like i think we can Let's go with the assumption that um, that GW is is is, adju- is adopting their entire strategy around this idea that you know we have hit saturation and um, you know we don't so we don't need to because I I, I kind of wonder if that's also affecting how they innovate their rules and how they evolve their games right um, sure and so what how are they trending I mean I, we've already we're going to talk about in the next episode the details of exactly what seventh edition is but yeah but. Um, in terms of what they're selling now and which games are supporting which games aren't, I mean, what do you think is happening right now? Well, uh, you know, they're definitely uh, they're definitely like going the Apple route, which is what we've been saying. They're they're trying to like you know stay to the upper end of the miniature gaming market, and they don't even you know people talk about having sales and stuff like that. That's just not even in the ballpark. Just like mm-hmm. Apple doesn't have sales and Apple doesn't right. put out prices, they they definitely want that that upper tier. Um, as for as for their games, um, you know, over the last year, uh, if you haven't been paying attention very well, you, you'll notice, first of all, it seems like The Hobbit, compared to Lord of the Rings, was a massive flop mm-hmm. in terms of sales. And the only reason I say that, because I don't have any sales numbers, is just because of the amount of coverage that Games Workshop gave it compared to when they brought out the original Lord of Rings yeah. and the amount of continuing support they continued after that. It seemed like when the move, the first movie came out, they gave it, you know, a box set and they put a little thing behind it and it, and then the next movie came out and there was very, very, very little, both releases and attention right. and anything. So it's, it's almost like they saw the writing on the wall and just gave up on it. And, mm-hmm. um, and strangely, similar is Warhammer Fantasy Battle. I mean, if you look at the releases last year of 40K products versus Warhammer Fantasy, it's, I, I, I want to say it's like five to one. Wow. Um, 
you know, it used to be, it would be, uh, you know, a codex and then a month off and then a Warhammer fantasy battle army book and then a month off and then a 40 K codex and then a month off and then a 40 K and it would go back and forth like that one to one pretty much. And this last year it would be like, especially towards the end of last year and into this early in this year, it would be like a codex, then a codex and a supplement Mm -hmm. and then a codex. And then there'd be like a Warhammer fantasy army book. So they really, 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 really scaled back what the Warhammer fantasy stuff they're releasing compared to their 40 K release schedule. Same with their digital releases, their rules releases. If you look at the amount of 40 K stuff put out on their, on their, on their rules releases, it's gigantic compared to Warhammer fantasy battle. Mm -hmm. So there's two ways you can look at this. And one is to say, uh, you know, 40 K is just more popular than fantasy battle. And they're finally realizing that. Or the other way is they had a period of, bad sales or, or bad sales with fantasy battle. And so they more or less have decided to run with what's popular rather than trying to push something that's not popular. That's really interesting. I wonder if that has to do with the market sizes, because I've always thought or understood, or maybe just assumed that Warhammer fantasy battle is better in Europe and in England in particular. And 40 K is better in the States. Well, that's what everyone always said. So but I don't know if that's true. I mean, I no data for that. Well, one thing I don't know, and, and nobody can know this for sure, it, it has always seemed to me that Games Workshop hasn't, and this could just be a public thing, maybe behind closed doors they all know it, but publicly at least, it doesn't seem like Games Workshop acknowledges that the rules um, that they put out affect the sales of their miniatures. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'll say a great example of this is the back Back in the day, for 40K, they came out with the Black Templars in the Armageddon subcodex. Yes, in like third or fourth edition. I remember the box set well, and uh, and this was just a little subcodex. But though this is uh, yeah, exactly, they had them in the box set too. Um, but what happened was those rules were insanely good, and all of a sudden, and they were easy to paint too, black and white. Right. So all of a sudden, every little kid was playing uh, black, black Templars, Templars and, yep. and everybody had these Black Templars armies all over the place. Couldn't keep the army boxes in stock. The army boxes yeah. were out the shelf. And then all of a sudden, you saw Games Workshop Shop say, well, since Black Templars are such a hugely popular army, we're going to give them a full codex all of their own. Hooray! Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, they came out with their own codex. And for a while, it, that was stupidly powerful, too. Right. And so it continued. Everybody was playing Black Templars. But then as you know, the, the rules creep continues on, as, as does happen with 40K, all of a sudden, the Black Templar army list fell out of favor in terms of power power level, mm-hmm. and suddenly you started seeing less and less people playing Black Templars. And that, and that continued to go, continued to go as, as it wore on. We got into 5th edition. There were still no, no new Black Templar codex. And then finally, 6th edition rolls around, and all of a sudden, the Black Templars drop out of the, the their web store as a separate thing, and, and the new uh, Space Marine codex comes out, and all of a sudden, Black Templars are back in, in mm-hmm. the Space Marine codex, uh, rolled in in a single codex. So, to me... And and you see that I've seen that a few times with them, and and I, I wonder if Warhammer Fantasy Battle, which, um, I mean I am not a Warhammer Fantasy player, uh, but I know that this last edition did not go over well with a lot of existing Warhammer mm-hmm. Fantasy Battle players, and beyond that, I don't know if that's the only thing. I mean I'm sure I know the new rules also encourage you to play with lots more models, and you know the prices are very expensive as well. So I think maybe those two things combined. You know, you know, may have an impact on people buying and playing Warhammer Fantasy Battle because the rules are something that aren't maybe the most popular. But it seems like if that's the case, Games Workshop may have said, "Well, people aren't buying Warhammer Fantasy products, so now we're going to push 40k." And I and I hope that that's not the case. But that kind of seems, from an outsider's perspective, like that sort of thing might be something that's happening. And that's and that's really kind of strange. Yeah, that's an interesting mm-hmm. observation too. I, I, it'd, be one, it'd be interesting to see. I know there were rumors floating around of it's the death of Warhammer Fantasy. I, I just can't see that happening mm-hmm. just because it's so core to who they are. Uh, you know, it's their first game and everything. But I maybe the rumors come from the fact that it was getting less support for a period of time. But you could argue that I, I could see the argument that because they decided to quickly do a new edition of 40k. You know, twice as fast as normal. Maybe they had to focus on 40k for a year. I mean, the other, I guess, the other side of the coin could be: well, maybe Fantasy is doing okay, and they realized 40k had problems from sixth, so they wanted to take, you know, just focus all their time for a solid year and a half to get 
seventh out and to redo the things they need to redo. Maybe I mean, is that possible, or you, you think that's yeah? Well, given the other other releases for 40k, the the supplementary codexes, the the digital data slates or whatever that you can buy, there's yeah. all this material that they're putting out for 40k. So it's not just it's not just rule. It's not just you know fixing codexes mm-hmm. or fixing a, a core. It's putting out additional material. It's putting out way more models, way more uh, you know up, updates compared to Fantasy Battle. So it doesn't seem like that. Well, maybe, I, I mean, I don't I don't know that they're going to get rid of Fantasy Battle. I would doubt that as well. I don't think you trash something that you have existing. But but what, but, what I think is interesting about this is I think they've got a new model here. Is what's really happening, and I think we've. You talk about this a bit in the main show that we're going to have in a, on a, in a little bit because they what they do is this this digital strategy now. And I want to talk about this a little bit with you and this this unbound rule set in seventh edition where you can basically mix and match any models you want. And now they can come out with you know ad hoc new units and new rule sets, sort of like you know at will. Um, gives them a lot of flexibility in terms of you know, modular new stuff they can just pop out. And I wonder if there's a whole new business model here that they're looking at. And for whatever reason, 40K um, is easier to test with this new business model. So like, well, let's try this where we can sort of mix and match stuff and and we can make that, we can see a way to make that work with the rules in 40K and we haven't figured that out in fantasy yet, so we're going to try that. Does, that. does that make even any kind of sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I... I definitely think of it as like 40k right now uh, especially is for gw has embraced the idea of like downloadable content mm-hmm. for for miniature games basically so you have all these all these digital and in most cases in a lot of cases they're digital only mm-hmm. you have these individual rules um that you can purchase from from the ibook store and basically download them and use them in their game. In some cases, you can go and buy these things, uh, you know, some of the supplementary codexes and stuff like that. But, but for the most part, it's it's all digital, so it's it's totally like downloadable content essentially. Um, and and I think that that is an interesting new frontier, if you want to put it that way. Um, the problem the the problem I personally have with it is they try to they want to position it as though. When when you look at their material, they say like if you like the the orcs, for example, you love the orcs and you want more than than what the orc codex has for you, then you're going to go and and get the orc supplementary codex, or you're going to download the digital data slate for orcs or whatever like that. But the problem is, it, the reality is that in a lot of cases, the rules are better or they make your army better by buying these things. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the Tyranid Codex, you know, it's kind of the same argument you get in video games these days where where they ask, uh, this downloadable content, is this stuff you purposely have left, you know, out of the game so you could then make it downloadable content? Or people argued about the on-disc downloadable content, stuff that's technically actually on the disc, but you can't actually unlock it until you pay pay extra extra money. Um, you know, the Tyranid Codex came out, and everybody was like, wow, this seems like a really, really, really bad codex. And then, uh, you know, a few weeks later, they came out with, with a digital download that was formations, you know, their new thing, mm-hmm. formations, where if you buy certain units in a certain combination, you get bonus special rules. They came out with a bunch of formations for the Tyranids that, that made them, you know, pretty competitive. And a lot of people were saying, ooh, you know, this seems really really potentially shady or a bad, bad way to go. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really, I think the worry, you know, there's a great side of, of having all that freedom and being able to constantly put out new stuff whenever they want to. Um, but the negative is if you feel like you have to buy something because your codex won't work as well without it, then you feel compelled, you know, right. you, you feel like you're missing out by not having those things. So now it's not an optional purchase. You know, instead of buying a fifty dollar ore codex, you feel like you have to pay a hundred dollars to get the ore codex and the supplement, and now you have to go spend another, you know, thirty dollars to download the extra stuff. And uh, you know, now they have they've just started coming out with exclusive rules in White Dwarf as well. So yeah. like the looted wagon that used to be in the ore codex, um, one of the things that seems to have happened um, with Games Workshop is they no longer have units in the codex that do not have models for the most part. Mm-hmm. So in the old days, they used to come out with a codex that would have a bunch of uh, units in it. 
um, that weren't there. And they would say, you know, you'd hope that down the road they were going to come out with the models for that. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. A lot of people attribute this change to um, the ruling with Chapter House. They had a big a big legal kerfuffle right, um, right. with a with a third party miniature manufacturer who was you know dangerously copying their their IP, and so some people say that because of that ruling, they just have have said we're not going to you know put units in the codex where we don't have models for, and the fact that they can now release those rules later when they come out with a model and and right. charge for them, it kind of makes sense as well uh, from from a business perspective to do it that way. Um, yeah, this is different than this is different than other companies are doing, like Weird and Privateer, where when a new model comes out, the rules are in the box of the model. Which, yeah. The thing to remember here is that you buy the model, but then you also need to pay for the rules for that model, right? So there's really they're really kind of kind of back to what we talked about earlier, where they're trying to monetize as much as they can their their fan base. You, if you want all things Tyranid, you need to buy all the models for your army. You need to buy the Codex. Well, that's the same as before, but now you need to buy. Um, these supplemental rules for the codex, add in add addendums to have all the different options you want, uh, and then any new models that go with that addendum, right? That's right. And you know, I still don't. I still wonder if they if they tried offering rules for free with with the models, and then still came out with their publications that were, you know, full color and and nice, mm-hmm. and and basically gave you the option to buy your digital rules so you could have them digitally. Um, you know, maybe maybe the PDF is free, but everyone knows a PDF isn't that great a, a you know a way to look at your rules. So if you want the iBooks, you can now buy the iBooks version. I still wonder if they went that route, if if they if it couldn't if they couldn't straddle the best of both worlds. But but like I said before, I I think they're they're looking for the the premium model, so it's it's just not something that makes sense to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting direction. I I think it's. Um... I don't know. I, I think what's been the reaction on the in the DACA community? I mean, people generally. I mean, I, I, it's weird because I'm, I'm watching and I see a lot of people saying when they see seventh and seeing how DW is doing stuff that they like the flexibility. So it seems like a lot of people seem to think it's cool. Yep. Um, but do you find is is it split? Is it is it eighty twenty? Most people like it. Twenty people don't. Is it the opposite of that? Have you got to read? You know, that? It's it's so hard to say because we uh, everyone knows or I don't know if everyone knows but if you go to your local gaming store and you say you just take a poll and you say how many of like go to the the Warhammer players and you say how many people have ever been to Daka Daka or ever go online to a gaming community mm-hmm. you actually find that it's a pretty small percentage right. and um, it's always surprises me um, and Games Workshop has always like tried to say that there's the, the you know the the people playing in their basement is the is the huge the huge percentage leader in right. in the actual gamer population. Yeah, that's why they don't really worry about organized play because they 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 have always theorized that it's mostly you know you and your buddies in your basement playing and just right. playing by your own rules with you know whatever you want to do right. So you know when if you see you know threads on back of people complaining about Games Workshop you know or praising it you know what what percentage does that really represent the overall gaming community and and if you know if these rules like unbound um that allow you to take basically any any units you want if these are popular with your your own gaming group where you guys can set your own limitations with each other then then that sort of freedom could be really liberating and really positive um so you know i've heard a lot of people really really liking seventh edition and and i think that has a lot of positives going for it as long as you are okay with the basic premise and direction and you know that you're okay with it and you like it and your friends like it and you're okay with sort of in that gaming space then i think it really hits you know it still does a great thing that no other game can come close to touching so cool so um so let's talk about what we like about so that kind of covers sort of what they've been doing and how they're how they're doing it today um what do we what do we like about i mean what do you think about um, what's going on today, Craig? Are you? Are you? Are, does it appeal to you as as sort of a longtime fan? You've never really been disenfranchised. Um, you just you, the rest of the our right. local gamers don't play as much as we used to. But you've mm-hmm. always kind of been a fan. It, does it feel like a right direction for you? Wrong direction? What do you think? Uh, it's it feels like a fun direction for me, but it doesn't. It it feels like they've gone away from competitive play, and so have I. So it mm-hmm. feels almost like they've followed me. In uh, in sort of like I, I like this game when I'm playing friends, people I know, people I'm comfortable with. 
I used to be competitive. I used to go to grand tournaments. I used to do quite well thanks to my sportsmanship and painting scores. Um, but, uh, but I would never do that now. Um, and, and, and that's not all on GW either. That has an awful lot to do with that team tournament, uh, uh, war machine tournament that you and, uh, and Rafe and I did. It was Rafe. Who was, who was the third person on our team? I forget. Rafe, but anyway, Rafe. yeah. Who, uh, that, that really turned me off to, to competitive events also. So, um, yeah, I, what I don't like is I don't like all this digital only stuff because I don't do the digital stuff. So it, I don't like the idea that I'll be playing with a cook. Well, that's another reason to play with just my friends who are all similar to myself. So, like, I would be concerned right now if I go to another state or a tournament or go to, like, I don't think I would ever bring a 40K army to Gen Con, for instance, to play listeners and we'll just have fun because I don't think it will be fun because. Like, I don't know, are you the guy who's got, like, the three latest downloadable content, you know, codex supplements, so you're using eight things, different things, and or unbound, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. So I think what they've done is they've kind of just opened it up to let each individual person or group make of it what they will. Yeah. And I think that it depends. So it's no longer sort of a universal game. And I think that... um I think that John would probably agree with this, considering his his work on the uh, the, the the giant F- FAQ and and now his ceasing to work on the giant FAQ is that it's 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 almost impossible to make it sort of a coherent across the board. This is the way everything should be because there's so many weird little things now, and you can do this, which then changes this, and you can do that, which then changes that. That it's almost like it almost. It makes it laughably unrealistic to to kind of make it that make a universal rule set out of this that everybody would agree. Yep, that's the game I play back home or close enough to it that I recognize it. So um, so I don't know. I think it comes down to the whole they I think they've made an interesting game. I think they'll continue. Uh, I don't think they're going away anytime soon. And I like I have I have enjoyed all three games of 40K that I've played in the last couple of weeks. Um but I, I, I would not, uh, I would not play it. Even if I was the person I was ten or fifteen years ago, back when we were all doing the grand tournaments, I don't think I would do. I would want to play grand tournaments with this version. I guess. One thing I should say about that is I, um, I actually, you know, still know a lot of the tournament organizers that were involved in in doing conference calls for the for the INAT FAQ, and they have been and continue to do so, communicate with each other to try to basically make uh, make sort of a, a similar FAQ that covers a lot of events. So you see a lot of them now. You know, they are they all still make their own decisions in the end uh, to their, have their own individual events. So I think you're, you're not going to see like one standard that is applied to every tournament, but I think there are going to be some sort of general decisions made um, to like, you know, cut down on the number of detachments that, that an army can contain and stuff like that to try to make sort of uh, some general sense of right. playing competitive 40 K and, and also similar FAQs. I mean, the, the number one, you hit it, hit the nail on the head as to why making an FAQ doesn't really work anymore. But also, I would say even more important than that is just the, the release schedule. I mean, the idea for the INAT was that it could be used for any event at any time. And mm-hmm. the, the way the release schedule comes out, you would, you would honestly have to do it like every month. You'd have to have a release every single month. So. Wow. So, that would be that'd be practically a full time job right there. Yeah. So so I, I'm I'm curious about this question and um you know GW is always to be fair to them they've always said that we don't design Warhammer forty thousand or any of our games to be competitively played. These are meant to be fun you know beer and pretzels events that you play in your house and the rules are a guide and do whatever you want right. They've they've always kind of had that position. Um, which has been frustrating to those of us who want to who want to play competitively. Now I'm, I'm with Craig nowadays. I don't play competitively, but that said, the reason I like games like War Machine and, and Malifo is that they're they're built um, to be competitive play. I don't play competitively, but I know the game is balanced out of the box. Are, are we at the point, or as, as balanced as any of these crazy games can be, out of the box? Um, is it has it gotten to the point where is GW really just saying, "Hey, game balance is hard, so we're not even going to try anymore." Um, 
But that's okay because you play whatever you want. And as long as you play with people who can agree on what a roughly balanced game is, everything's fine. And that's what this is about. So kind of back to Rogue Trader when, when 40K was more of an RPG and you just grabbed a bunch of stuff and went at it and you got a Space Marines with uh, Shirk and Catapults and everybody was happy with that. Or is it is it something else? you think they're giving up on the whole concept of game balance? Well, it kind of seemed like starting with 6th edition when they allowed allies into the game, um, when it came to sort of like competitive balance in sort of like a competitive environment, an organized environment, like a tournament, it really became more about taking individual units out of the codex and then combining them with other powerful units from another codex. And so previously, in previous editions, if you had an orc codex and it was weak, you would have to sit there for five years and wait for your new codex to come out, and then you would hope that your new codex was super powerful so you could then compete. And if it wasn't, you were, you know, screwed. And if it was powerful, then, yay, you would be on the top of the heap now for the next, you know, few months until another codex comes out and may or may not sort of, like, you know, topple you. So what Allies did in 6th edition was it changed that paradigm because now even – the codex that people were thinking is the worst might have some really great units in it that you can now combine with great units from the newest codex that just came out to make a super powerful army. Mm -hmm. And so that meant every single codex that came out was basically a new tool to potentially power up your old codex that was, you know, four or five years old or whatever. So it really kind of changed that from a competitive balance. Now, you know, if you are into the game purely as a game, uh, not, you know, divorced from the background, I think that that's kind of a great thing because you always, you know, you're, if you're willing to go out and buy new models for, uh, you know, ally models, you can plug them into your, into your army and, and potentially give yourself a, a decent chance. But if you're someone who really likes the background of, of the 41st millennium uh, and the army is the way they're supposed to be fought based on what you've read and you believe, then all of a sudden seeing all these wacky allied combinations was kind of like a uh, blasphemous um, right. in sixth edition. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they kind of changed how the allied work in seventh edition. And they obviously introduced unbound where you can just basically take anything. Um, but I, that almost seems like that's, that's their answer. And I mean, you know, all I can say is, at this point, because of Unbound, the only true balancing factor is essentially point value for the unit. Mm-hmm. And those are not balanced because if you look at any competitive army, you, you see people taking multiples of the same unit because that unit is really good for the points cost. And you right. see certain units never getting play in a tournament because their points cost is too high for what they do. Um, so to the idea that now that we have sort of a system where you can pull any units from any codex anywhere and play with them just based solely on this point value as the balancing effect, I think that that's, that's a, a pie-in-the-sky idea of, of balance between units based on point value because it doesn't apply even when you're just using one codex, let alone pulling from every codex. So, so yeah, I think... I mean, I don't know if it's their intention or not, but I think for fun and friendly games, you're still using your codexes, you're using your formations or whatever you want to do. And then for, for you know, competitive play, in their mind, you know, if you're leaving the door open to everything the 40K has to offer, then it does sort of balance itself out in that you can, anybody can take anything to counter everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's. It just feels that way to me, and I, you know, and I again, even if you're not a competitive player, I think the, the I think the key is like, where do you draw the line? Because if you started getting into a game and you start buying models and you start getting into it, and all of a sudden you happen to buy a unit that you like the look of, but it becomes it's really really powerful, and your opponent starts losing all the time, and they mm-hmm. to now what do they do? Right, so so they. They have to buy, they have to figure something out in, in, in maybe the models they, that appeal to them aren't really balanced. And so what do they do? So it's like, I, I think eventually if you start to play regularly and became your only game you played, um, unless you were really into it just for the modeling and the, and the playing itself was really just to watch what unfolds on the battlefield and no one's playing to win, which you can totally do. And I get that. Um, but that's a level of non-competitiveness that, that is very rare in most people. Most people have a desire at least to try to beat their opponent. Um, Great. not at not any cost, but they want to have a decent chance to win. Um, and that's, I think you, you, I think you've gotten to the point, I think the game's in a place now where you almost, to be as fair as you can to your opponent, you can't design your list to win 
and you can't play the game to win. Because well, you, you, do, you just you, have to set the ground rules up ahead yeah. of time, and, and then you're okay to design your list based within those ground rules. Right, so, right. you know, right. whether that's a tournament that has a set of rules you're playing to or whatever, but you certainly can't break open the book and say, hey, I'm going to design the most killer, nasty list and then take that to my game store and play it against somebody else, and, and they're going to be okay if I stomp them into the dust right. because it, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I just feel like I feel like you're going to get into if your game groups gets bigger than two or three people, you're going to get into arguments about. Well, I'm not going to play that crazy thing you just brought. And you're like, what are we talking about? I, I worked painting these models for two months and I love them and I, I I don't think it's overpowered. No, it's crazy. That's stupid. I want to play that. You know, it's like you get in these big arguments and it just breaks down and it, and it becomes I don't know. But I guess if you keep it very light and, and friendly and you don't even. You know, you're like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll fight that crazy thing you brought today because it does look cool on the table, and, and even though I have no way to defeat it, you know, kind of thing. Um, so anyway, anyway I, I think it's interesting where they're going. I, I real, John, I really liked your analysis on the whole, um, you know, they've kind of felt their market saturated, and now they've, they've adopted these new strategies to kind of uh, take it out, to, to, to change how they do business. And I think that makes a, a, a good way to get context around anything. And I know we're going long. I don't want to go too much longer, but... One thing I wanted to talk about, I saw this thread on DACA and an interesting conversation. And the, the theme of the thread was maybe a, a little, not only negative, but it was basically, you know, I, now that you've moved on from it Games Workshop. It seems negative to me. Yeah, well, now that you've moved on from <laughs> Games Workshop, what are you playing now? But, yeah. but I thought the interesting, the, the, the third or fourth post down I thought was a really interesting post where someone had this theory that if you're going to play miniature war games, at least play, try three different game systems from three different companies. Mm-hmm. And see what's out there. So you can understand the different choices you have. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a is that a good advice or or is it really nah? Yeah, what the hell? If you if you like a game and you like the models, stick with what you like. Um, do you think it make, Do you think people should should play the field a little bit before they lock in and start spending lots of money on one particular game system? Well, what do you think, Russ? <laughs> and See, turn it back around on you. Uh, I think that um, you should you should play what you like. I think the, the two big things are really community. So I, I don't, but I'm weird, right? So I don't enjoy just playing a single game with one person. <laughs> I like to, I like to play with a group of people. I like to have community. My favorite part about miniature war gaming is discovering the size of the community. And my favorite thing about Games Workshop was, and still is, is the size of the community. That was what the best thing about the game to, to know that there's that many people. When you go to Games Day, or you used to go to Games Day, and you see all those people there who played the same thing as you, it's like, whoa, this is, it's kind of like a convention now. If you go to a comic book convention or a comic book collection, you're like, whoa, look at these people that like comic books. This is crazy. Um, so that's what the feeling I got. And I like that sense of it. But I also like the idea that I could bring out a game and play people. And when I played them, we wouldn't argue about it. We'd just play the game. And so I didn't find that game. I thought I had found that game with, with 40K. But I didn't really find that game until I played War Machine. And... I haven't argued about rules the way I used to argue about the rules in 40K since I moved to War Machine. And I, I think that's what changed for me. So I do, and I, I used to laugh at War Machine players. I used to, I, I was like, this is, that game's stupid. Look at those little, windows. that's a dumb, why would you even, what, what are you doing? It's got like four factions and there's only like three miles per faction. It was back when I first came out, I was like, why would you even play that silly thing? Um, you know, I mean, vehicle, and now I, I'm almost reversed. And I think it's because, almost. um, yeah, I think it's because uh, well, I play other games too, but I think it's and I think it's because I was I finally took the chance to look around and try other games. So I I do think there's value in doing it, um, but I don't want people to look at to take that advice and say, well, I can't really play any miniature war games until I invest in three. That does seem a little bit crazy. Um, yeah. Um, well, one thing I would just say about that really quick. There's a uh, there's a book called The Hundred Greatest Hobby Games of All or Hundred Greatest Games of All Time, and Warhammer 40K is in there. Someone yeah. nominated that, and in that little essay, the, the person writes, one of the things he points out is if you make a game where people argue about your rules, then that's a level of investment that they <laughs> that they want to have in terms of they actually get some sort of enjoyment about discussing and arguing about rules and. T- intricacies. Sure. And so it may not be for you uh, particularly, but I actually wonder if that's part of part in a strange way, part of what has endured for such a long time is, is, uh, is that sort of engagement in, in rule smithing. I know, I know that, you know, me, me owning DACA is 
I would, that would not have happened if, mm. if I didn't want to come and argue about 40 K rules back in the day. So it's a strange, it's a strange, strange thing. Um, but when it comes to three games, you know, I think it comes back to what do you get from, from what do you want and what do you get from miniature gaming? And, you know, for me, um, you know, I like that tactical challenge, but, but more than anything else, what drew me and what kept me to 40 K was the background and, mm. and that, and the models and the, is the, the aesthetic. And then on top of that, I wanted to, I'm a very competitive person. So I like to kick butt for a while. I was really super intense. And at one point I just calmed down, but, but, um, but that's, that was the driving factor. So, so to me, you know, I think a lot of people that say you should try three miniature games. I think a lot of those people are talking about, uh, rules mechanics, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, because they're saying like, if you don't like this aspect of the rules in this game, you should try these other two games. So you have some sort of like, you know, breadth of, of knowledge of, of what you, what is out there. And, and it's certainly, I think that's good advice to try stuff. But at the same time, if you know, like, like, I could never play War Machine just because I don't really like fantasy and that aesthetic of the uh, the giant oversized uh, walker arm dudes like mm. smashing around. It's just I could never get over that no matter how much I tried. So no matter how great the rules are, I, I just know deep within me that's not ever going to be a game that I'm ever interested in. So, you know, if it comes to just winning a game, you know, you can play you can play board games you know right. you don't have to paint anything you don't have to do anything you just play a game and you win and you get all that so to me the miniature gaming is about is about models and aesthetics and all that all the history in the background and all that and so that's as much a part of of anything and so so playing three different games isn't going to help you if you don't like the other the aesthetics and the models in the other two games so that's true for sure I, mm -hmm. great great commentary yeah. Well, John, and I think it's all what you want. Ultimately. It is. It is all what you want. I mean, you can't yeah. say don't play 40k until you played two other games, or like don't collect. It, I mean, if you love it and lots of people do, then do what you like. Yeah. yeah. Be happy. Right. Right. Be yeah. happy. Be happy. 40k will give you great joy and happiness if you let it. It will. It will. It that's, might. that's for sure. <laughs> um, so, and on that happy note, see, no hate at all. Now, on that happy, happy note. Um, we will, happy, John. Happy, thank happy, you so much, happy, John, like a, for uh, like a forty k knob without a gun. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> see, he would not be happy. My hat just got wicked big, though. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> John, thank you so much for joining us here at Dunkin' Donuts and sharing your lovely uh, milk bars. Is that what those are? Buttermilk bars. Buttermilk bars. All right, got I'm gonna it. send you them. I'm gonna mail them to you. All right, awesome. Yes, we're gonna and we will eat I will them. Wait with bated breath, John. Next time you come on the show, we won't be talking about 40k. Probably no. <laughs> we'll have to talk about something else. <laughs> we need a whole new topic, John. We got to. You, you don't get know. On it might all turn around. Who knows? You got to get you on. You never that. can okay. tell. You That's never can true. tell. Right. Right. That's very true. Well, John, well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, and. And uh, I don't know. I can't wait to come back sometime. No, we, we can't wait to have you back. And, of course, in, a, in about a week or so, we'll have you on the main show. Can't wait. Yep. Hooray. All right. Huzzah. Thanks, John. Thanks for purchasing a D6G Lost Chapter. Supporting the show helps it grow. 